our guest a man who has done the impossible, a man who sailed the wrong way round the world against the wind. So let's give a big welcome to our guest this week, Che Blythe. Che, do you really believe that you do the impossible or do you think anyone with sufficient determination can do what you've done? Yes, I think uh, I don't do the impossible. Anyone who wants to, uh, to try something like that can, as a rule, can do it. It's nothing to do with me. I'm not special. I've only got two arms, two legs, the same as everybody else. It's just a case of uh, organising yourself and just being able to go out there and do it. What draws you to these adventures? <clears throat> what does it give you? Well, um, I think, really, it all goes back to when I rode across the North Atlantic. Um, I really done that because um, I've been interested in adventure for some time and survival. I'd never done any sea stuff at all, but um, here this opportunity came along, so I thought I'll take it. So I went off and rode across the Atlantic, and from that I realized there was an opportunity for people to do these sort of things, and I just carried on from there. But could your adventures draw you, in fact, in every direction? So far, it just seems to have been to the sea. But have you got any plans to climb anything or make journeys <laughs> through well, it, it, uncharted parts of the world, if there are any left? Yes, you can do anything. You know, the, it doesn't really matter what it is. Because, as I say, I'm not a climber yet. I've done a climbing expedition. I'm not a diver yet. I've done a diving expedition. You know, there's nothing special about it. It's just the will to actually want to do it. And you gear yourself and you go off and do it. It's mm. as simple as that. Well, I know our audience are going to put a lot of questions to you in a moment, Che, but before they do, let's uh, hear about the beginning of all your adventures and some of the amazing things that you've done and the hazards that you've had to face. Round the world sailor extraordinary Che Blythe at home in the more peaceful waters of Dartmouth. For Che, the Spartan conditions of round the world sailing must contrast sharply with the good life ashore which his success has brought him. But with the sea on his doorstep, his past and future sailing expeditions can never be far from his mind. Great Britain, too, is the boat in which Che and the crew of 12 competed in the round-the-world yacht race last year. At 77 feet long, she cost £120,000 to build and was a gift to Che from the millionaire Jack Hayward. She's named after the first Great Britain, Brunel's famous ship, which Jack brought back to England from the Falkland Isles. Coming from a family with not much money, Che has had to earn his reputation as a sailor to justify such enormous sums of money being spent on him. He first hit the headlines when he and John Ridgway rowed across the Atlantic in an open boat in 90 days, and subsequently he set off in a boat borrowed from some friends to sail around the world. He had only six hours solo sailing experience to his name. That journey ended at South Africa, but with a rather perverse sense of challenge, Che decided to have another go, but this time from east to west, against the prevailing winds. Such a journey needed a specially built boat, a boat of steel, a boat costing £20,000. With an empty bank balance and only the idea itself to sell, Che persuaded the British Steel Corporation to sponsor his idea. He completed the impossible voyage in 292 days, a record for a non-stop voyage around the world. It was here in Philip Shipyard in Dartmouth that British steel was built. From drawing board to launch is a long process. Che's voyage posed special demands which stretched the imagination of the designer and experience of the shipbuilders. Rather like a dress pattern, a ship is broken down into parts and drawn onto thin sheets of plywood. These are then laid out in a room and final adjustments are made. The wooden shapes are then transformed into steel. Che Blythe is concerned with survival, challenging the impossible and succeeding. He has plans to walk to the South Pole. He has plans to sail off again, this time with his wife and daughter. When that happens, as always, his boat will carry the motto, O oh God, thy sea is so great and my boat is so small, as a reminder, perhaps, of his vulnerability and the hazards to come. Che, you talk a lot about 
God in your logbooks about the third force and God watching over you. And I think in your logbook in your 1968 voyage, you actually say, prayed for our deliverance as I've never prayed before. Is this something you just feel when you're at sea on your own? Well, it's, it's, it's always with me at sea. The odd thing about it is that I never actually pray when I'm on land. I never go to a church. I don't pray, I don't do anything. Yet the minute I go to sea, I pray. And I tend to joke about it because people don't like to get too heavy about uh, religion. Uh, but I tend to joke about it and say that uh, God and I have a deal, and that is that uh, when I'm at sea, he looks after me. When I'm on land, I give him a plug on the telly. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have some questions from our audience. Who'd like to put the first question? Trevor. Have you always liked sailing? Well, not really, no. I only took up sailing directly after rowing across the Atlantic, which was 1966. So I've only been sailing for a relatively a short period of time, since 1968, in fact. Suzanne. What were your feelings when you set off in um, British Steel? Well, I was very glad to get away. And the reason for that is that um, you come to a very high pitch. The tension gets, uh, gets very hard. You, people phone up asking you all sorts of funny questions. And uh, all your equipment's been packed. And you've got all your equipment. You've had to chase around and get it. And there's a terrific amount of fever built up. And uh, you really want to just get away. And once you're clear of land, of course, and you're on your own, then you can start to relax. And you can think, well, you know, fine, that's that, and, and you can settle into the job in hand. So you, by the time you're ready to go, you really want to go. Yes. Let's come down to the front row on the left and have a question from Alison Neat. How did you find being on your own so long affected you? Well, I'll tell you, Alison, I think it's uh, very, very pleasant indeed. A lot of people think that it's, it's going to be very bad and that uh, you're going to go um, off your head or something like that, but it's not like that at all. It really is very, very pleasant. You can do what you want, when you want. And although you must keep yourself relatively disciplined, that is to say you must uh, have your meals at the proper times and you must uh, wash and shave and look after yourself, you can relax a little by putting up what sale you want and when. And it really is very pleasant. You can uh, take in the, the poetry of the sea and and everything is so quiet and beautiful. It really is very, very pleasant indeed. Anne Keelan. Have any of your boats ever been in danger of being damaged by whales or sharks? Not, not from sharks, because um, sharks really are quite small uh, in comparison with a 60-foot yacht or a 77-foot yacht. So it takes a very big shark to do any damage there. They may scrape along the side, I'm sure you all know that sharks have got parasites on their skin and uh, they will scrape along the side of the yacht like itching themselves. But that won't damage the yacht. But killer whales can certainly uh, damage a yacht. And near Cape Horn, we had a, at least I think they were killer whales, some whales following us. And for that reason, I took some explosives to throw over the side to frighten them off. But I never actually had to use them. We. Uh, they moved away after a while, but I thought then they were killer whales. What's the greatest danger that you faced on that solo voyage? <clears throat> you can't really pin down any particular danger saying that being the greatest danger. Um, the reason each one, you know, is uh, the minute it's happened and it's over with, it's in a memory. And so the next one mm. is the, the most dangerous. But I think I can remember one occasion I was, there's a fine line between exhilaration and fear. For instance, you're very, you know, it's great fun when you're walking along the tightrope, but if you fall, it's then fear. And uh, I can remember one occasion, I was sailing along, I was by the tiller, and I was going away there quite happy, and I was on a broad reach, and I was doing about 10 knots, and then suddenly this great wave sort of sneaked up on me, and I didn't see it, and it broke over the yacht, and um, I jumped up the mast, or not right up the top, but, you know, part way up, and held on like mad. And the wave broke over the boat, and... Uh, for a split second, the whole yacht was completely submerged in water, and all I could see was the mast and rigging coming out of the, out of the water. And for one split second, I thought, this is it. And uh, then, of course, we came up, and he thought, goodness me, that was fun. 